Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. We are here to commemorate a good Friday where our Lord and Savior died for our sins on that old rugged cross on Calvary's hill. We thank you for your presence here today and we are so delighted to have these ministers of the gospel, these pastors and preachers. Can we give the Lord a hand for all of these pastors and preachers that are with us today? I'm excited, I am really excited. I know God has given them a word to share and we, I ask that you would open your hearts, prepare your soul to hear what thus saith the Lord on today. We're gonna ask our very own Sister Pearson if she could come at this time. Once again, praise the Lord. If you love God, say, I love you, Lord. If God's done anything for you, say, thank you, Jesus. And if you come to give him everything that is within you, stand up on your feet right now and give him another hand clap of praise and applause because he so deserves it. I stand before you to call you to worship. You know, biblically, all the people of God were called. They were called together to come together and they were told this is the time that we are going to honor God and this is what we're going to do. So today we are going to acknowledge his suffering. This is the day that we come together to remember his suffering. He loved us. He gave his life for us. So we're going to draw near to the cross today in full assurance of his mercy and of his grace. We give thanks to him as Jesus the Christ. He still carries our sorrow. He heals our wounds, and He redeems us from our sin of death. So we acknowledge His pain and suffering today. We are called into confession and repentance. And let us agree in the Spirit that the memory of His death will be life-giving today. We think of death, but there is also life in Jesus the Christ. Does anybody agree with that? His life-giving presence today and we pray that he will honor what we offer unto him by coming in the midst of us, making his presence known. So we are called to worship. And let's begin with a shout out. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O oh God. We love you, Lord. We praise you, O oh God. We glorify you in this place. There is none like you. God, you love us, we love you back. You first love us, oh God. That's what we speak unto them this morning. Now as we set our minds and our focus on Jesus the Christ and his suffering, let's join our voices together in a corporate supplication. That means all of us together. We're going to sing, sing a very familiar hymn, Near the Cross. That is what we're asking him to do, is keep us near him today as remember his suffering. It's music, but the words express what we believe in our heart. Be my glory forever. Jesus, keep me near the cross. It's familiar, you already know it. Come on, sing with me. Jesus. individual and corporate free In the cross, 
word speak to you. Rest beyond. We're going to go to the last verse. The very last verse. golden strand that golden strand just beyond come on let every boy sing the sing again without the music. Don't you feel that? Don't you feel that? your hands on that. Amen, saints of God. Amen. We will have our scripture by our very own Reverend Jeanette Cody, followed by prayer by Minister Douglas, and then our welcome by Deacon Cliff Taylor. After our welcome, we're going to be blessed by a good friend of mine, Pastor Camille Holmes, the pastor of New Hope Baptist Church right downtown, and he's going to bless us with solo. If you could come in that order. In the cross, in the cross, Pastor Waters, our distinguished pulpit guests and associates, and to each of you, my brothers and sisters, hear the word of the Lord as found in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 10. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace 
was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our God. Good morning, all brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning to our distinguished platform guests. I greet each of you in the matchless and magnificent name that is above every name, Jesus the Christ. On this holy week, the holiest week on the Christian calendar, Bless you all for coming out today to remember the ultimate sacrifice that our Savior came from glory to give his life that we would all have a right to the tree of life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you we exalt you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We glorify you. We reverence your holy name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. For you are Elohim, the creator. You are El Elyon, the most high. You are Jehovah Sikhanu, our righteousness. You are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. By your stripes, by your many stripes, we are healed. You are Jehovah Jireh our provider you provided the ultimate sacrifice you were willing and obedient and you left your home in glory to be the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world you shed your most precious blood lord for our sins you were wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities chastisement of that peace were upon you and by your stripes we are healed Lord we are eternally grateful for your sacrifice Lord we thank you Lord we thank you for giving your life on Calvary but most of all Lord we rejoice that on the third day you rose again with the keys to hell and death hallelujah we thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life. Oh, death, where is your sting? 
O oh, grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to you, Lord, for the victory through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for each of your servants as they bring the word today, Lord. Speak to them and speak through them, Lord. May you prepare our hearts to be receptive and our spirits to be uplifted. Lord, may we never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good afternoon, Green Forest. Oh, what a wonderful time it is to be in the house of the Lord. I am so honored this afternoon to welcome all our guests and, guests, guests and visitors. I'll let everyone get in first as I proceed with this. Uh, it's such a blessed day. Good Friday is such a blessed day. Will all our guests and visitors please stand and remain standing for just a moment. All of our guests and visitors. Hey, hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Again, I'd like to welcome you to this service on this day. We have a lot of activities that are going on here at Green Forest, and you are welcome to visit and participate in all of them. Please remain standing for just a moment if you don't mind. Over the, uh, over the Easter, over this Easter weekend, a lot is going on for tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We have an evangelist blitz where we'll go out into the neighborhoods. At noon, we have extravaganza for the children. Bring your children if you have children participate in that. Then on Easter Sunday morning, we will meet at 6.30 a.m. for our sunrise service. And you don't want to miss that. It's 6.30 a.m. Following that service, the men of Green Forest will be honored to prepare and serve all of the ladies' breakfast. And we'll even clean up afterwards, ladies, so you don't have to worry about that either. <laughs> So you're certainly welcome to participate in that. And immediately following breakfast, the children of Green Forest will present a wonderful Easter program. Now, if you happen to visit us on a regular Sunday, our services start at 8.45 a.m. And immediately after service, we have fulfillment hour in your church. You may know it as Sunday school. So you are most welcome. We are so happy that you chose to join us today. We have a saying at Green Forest that goes something like this. Feel free, you may visit us time and time again, but when you get tired of visiting us, please join us. Thank you, now you may be seated. Thank you. C sharp, if you will. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose. The blood that Jesus shed 
It's all right to praise the Lord. I feel like we're a little tight in here. It's all right to praise the Lord. Do I have about three people that came to praise the Lord today that you know the blood would never lose its power? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Holmes, for that wonderful, wonderful, oh my God ushering us into the presence of the Lord with that wonderful song. We thank you so much to Deacon Taylor blessing us with the welcome to Minister Douglas. Thank you for that beautiful prayer. And to our Mr. Cody, we thank you as well for that beautiful scripture. You all, it's preaching time. We are here today to commemorate the seven last sayings from the cross by Jesus, we have with us seven preachers of the gospel. Amen. We are blessed for our first preacher to be the pastor of the Shiloh Baptist Church in McDonough, Georgia, the Reverend Karen Kelly. Can we give God a hand of praise for her? Amen. 
I have known Reverend Kelly now for almost 15 years. She has been very active in the New Era Missionary Baptist State Convention. She is serving as one of the vice presidents of that state convention. She has moved all through the ranks, serving from the lowest position into Christian education over the youth and now as VP and one day president. Amen, somebody. Her service at Shiloh has been commendable as she has brought a renewed spirit and healing and vitality to that church. And she will be coming with her first saying today, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do from Luke 23 and 34. Would you receive her as she comes today? Luke chapter 23 and verse 34 reads, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. I would like to talk on today from the thought, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. In Luke chapter 23, we get a front row seat to an execution scene that included two criminals and the innocent Jesus. All three were crucified. They arrived at what the Romans would have called Calvary and the Jews Golgotha. And after Jesus arrived at the place of the skull, he is crucified between two thieves. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy found in Isaiah chapter 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb, he is led out to the slaughter, and like a sheep is silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Jesus, as the Lamb of God, voluntarily laid down his life. He did not try to stop those who opposed him. He remained silent rather than defend himself. When Jesus went before the Jewish council, he answered not a word. When the people chose Barabbas over Jesus, he answered not a word. When he was placed on the cross, Jesus answered not a word. When he is mocked by the bystanders, he answered not a word. When he is mocked by the Roman soldiers, Jesus answered not a word. Amidst the gas, the sighs, and the groans, we can see in our sanctified mind, Jesus' lips began to move. He isn't asking for pity from the people. He isn't asking the people to take him down. He isn't pronouncing judgment on the people. Very early in this awful scene of crucifixion, our Lord and Savior began to pray. In Jesus' dying hour, he fulfilled Old Testament prophecy by interceding for the transgressors. Jesus knew and understood the power of prayer. In Luke chapter 3, after Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that he prayed and the heavens opened up. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for us as believers. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. While on earth, Jesus prayed. And now that he has ascended to the right hand of God the Father, Jesus is making intercession for us. Jesus is our intercessor. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our defense. Aren't you glad that Jesus intercedes? for us. 
Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of his opponents. As the soldiers laid him on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. As he had the nails driven through his wrists and his feet, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. As they lifted the cross and placed it in the hole, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. And as Jesus listened to those who were mocking him, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Jesus could have prayed, Father, judge them. Father, avenge me. Father, destroy me, destroy them. Jesus could have prayed, Father, hurt them like they've been hurting me. He could have called down legions of angels to deliver him at that moment but he did not. Instead, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Between the gaps of breath and the cries of pain, he is not praying for himself, but he is praying for his enemies. Notice now, Jesus did not pray for their wealth. He did not pray for the prosperity of the nation. He did not pray for the hungry and the homeless or the sick and the lame. Jesus prayed for their forgiveness. Because see, Jesus knew then, and he still knows today, that a person's greatest need is forgiveness. See, see, you may want money stacked up in the bank, but you need God's forgiveness. You may want a closet full of clothes, but you need God's forgiveness. You may want a new car or a new diamond ring, but you need God's forgiveness. Jesus prayed that God would give mankind what it needed the most, which was God's forgiveness. Is there anybody here who is glad like I am that I have been forgiven? Jesus voluntarily laid down his life to provide forgiveness of sins. He did not die for a political cause. He did not die as an enemy of the state. He did not die for someone's envy. Jesus died to provide forgiveness of sins. And at this moment, Jesus prays for his enemies. Jesus asked God to forgive without even naming for whom he was praying. He asked God the Father to forgive them, not just the soldiers who nailed him to the cross, but all of those who were involved in his death. Jesus' prayer of forgiveness was for everyone who participated in him going to Calvary. Father, forgive Judas who betrayed me. Father, forgive the Jewish leaders who had me falsely arrested. Father, forgive the crowd who yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Father, forgive Pilate who found me to be innocent yet still gave me up to be crucified. Father, forgive the soldiers who whipped me all night long, mocked me, spit on me, and nailed me to the cross. Father, forgive them, is what Jesus said. Our Lord not only prayed for them, but look at the text. Our Lord even argued their their case on their behalf. It is as though Jesus stood as a lawyer and said to the Father, let me give you a reason why you should forgive them. Forgive them because they are ignorant as to who I really am. Forgive them because they just don't know what they are doing. In this prayer, Jesus recognized the blindness of his enemies. This does not excuse their guilt who, of those who put Jesus on the cross, but Jesus realized that his enemies needed forgiveness because of their ignorance. The people with their leaders had acted 
acted in ignorance in the sense that they did not recognize who Jesus really is. They did not believe that he is the son of the living God. As Peter declared in Acts chapter 3, in their ignorance, they handed Jesus over and denied him in the presence of Pilate. In their ignorance, they denied the holy and the righteous one and asked for Barabbas to be freed. In their ignorance, they crucified the very source of all life. They just did not know what they were doing. Although they were looking at the Messiah, they did not want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Although they knew Old Testament prophecy, they did not know that prophecy was being fulfilled before their very eyes. So they mocked him as a prophet. They mocked him as a king. They laughed at him because he claimed to be the son of God. They shouted to him, if you save others, why don't you save yourself? They just did not know what they were doing. If we, Green Forest and everybody else that was here, if we were to allow our minds to roll back, to when we were not saved. We will understand that we are just like the them in verse 34. Let our minds roll back to when we were so deep in sin that we did not know which day of the week it was. We were so deep in sin that we didn't know if we were coming or if we were going. We didn't care about God or anything anyone else. We might not have been hurting ourselves or anybody else, but we were lost without God. We were just like the them in verse 34. When we were unsaved, we were not thinking about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, or even the church. Our minds were in the dark. We were stubborn and we were ignorant. We were enemies of God. We were doing what was right in our own eyes and we were doing what felt good to the flesh. Because of sin, we were separated from God and we were without hope. We almost missed out on a life that comes from God. We were insensitive to God, insensitive to his word, and insensitive to his people. Our hearts were hard and they were wicked, but God, but God brought us near by the blood of Jesus, but God in his patience overlooked our ignorance to give us another chance. But God in his patience held back his wrath to give us another chance. But God in his patience did not allow us to die in our sins. Is there anybody here who is happy on this Good Friday that we did not die in our sins just like us they just did not know what they were doing neither the Jewish accuser nor the Roman executor nor they did not fully realize the gravity of their actions the Jews were protecting the Roman establishment and the Romans were protecting their political territory they were not aware that they were executing the son of the living God who came to save his people they failed to realize just who it was who was hanging on the cross they did not know that they were crucifying the very image of the invisible God they did not know that they were crucifying the firstborn of all creation they did not know that they were crucifying the creator and the sustainer of this world. They did not know that they were crucified, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the
the Omega, the author and the finisher of our faith. They just did not know what they were doing, for had they known, is what Paul says, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but God. But God used them to take part in God's plan of salvation. But God used them as instruments in his mighty hand to bring about his divine plan. Because how many of you know that although they did not know what they were doing, they were doing a good thing. See, it was a good thing because, see, while hanging on the cross, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was a good thing because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was a good thing because God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Although they did not know what they were doing it was a good thing because Jesus was lifted up and the Bible says that Jesus says that if I am lifted up from the earth I'll draw every man every woman unto me they did not know what they were doing but because they did what they did the addict can stagger up to the cross and find forgiveness. The sinner can walk up to the cross and find forgiveness. The liar, the gossiper, and the backbiter can walk up to the cross and find forgiveness because of what they did. Every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl can walk up to the cross and find forgiveness. That's why God's grace is so amazing. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that broke my liberty. I don't know why he comes to love me so, but he looked beyond all of my faults and saw my need. Hallelujah. Father, forgive them. Come on, let's give the Lord another hand of praise for this preacher of the gospel. Thank you so much, Pastor Kelly. Moving right along, our second preacher, Reverend Dr. Wanda Holder, who is no stranger to the Green Forest. Amen. She served for 27 years as the Minister of Congregational Life. She is now serving as an assistant pastor for the First Baptist Church in East Point, Georgia. We thank God for her presence here today and look forward to her blessing us with a word from the Lord. Would you receive her as she comes with today shalt thou be with me in paradise from Luke 23 and 43. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand of praise as she comes. Hey, amen, amen. To God be the glory, to, amen, to Pastor Waters and to Pastor Hicks and all my gospel siblings, God bless you, and all my brothers and sisters. It is so good to see you, be in the house of the Lord for, and up here for five minutes. Amen, amen. To God be the glory. Uh, what a dichotomy. What a dichotomy. We have one who is sinless in between those men, those criminals who had done some of everything. We do not have the details of all the things that they did, but we know they were nothing like Jesus. What a sandwich made up on the cross, amen? It was good meat in between and raw and messed up and decayed bread on the end. 
I just got a little image going on here. We understand there was some, uh, uh, some criminal conversation going on. We had one on that said, why, bro, if you are so powerful, if you all that, why won't you just save us all and bring us down from here? I'm just going to talk in the vernacular that we all are used to. I understand that you have, are the king of kings and the lord of lords, and yet you're up here on this cross bleeding and crying and swollen like I am. But the other thing, other criminal, because you don't know what all the things that he did, the other criminal said, listen, bro, what are you talking about? Aren't you afraid of God? This man has not done anything. Everything that we have done, we deserve to be up here. And you over there talking that smack that he needs to take us down, but you have no need to be uh, talking against this man of God, I tell you what, we're talking about a criminal. I want to say he was like the righteous criminal. He looked over and he saw Jesus. He saw him. He saw the man, this man, who is the savior of the world. He saw Jesus, who is the one that can redeem the world. He saw Jesus, the one that can restore the world. He saw Jesus, he, that Jesus, that love unconditionally. He saw a man that he knew within his heart. I think that criminal has a little bit of discernment. I believe he's got a place for me. I'm saying, Lord, Will you go into your kingdom? Please remember me. And Jesus looked back and saw him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. It is not a delay. It's not didactic. It's not something you got to make a schedule for. But today you'll be with me in paradise. That is how it is. When Jesus gives you something, it's not a delay. It's always on time. When Jesus gives you something, you can rely on it. When Jesus gives you something, you understand that you can take it to the bank. When Jesus gives you something, it is real. When Jesus gives you something, it is authentic. It is authentic. When Jesus gives you something, you don't have to worry about it being taken back from you. When Jesus gives you something, I love the fact when Jesus gives you something, it is already all right. This man, this criminal, recognized who Jesus was. This man, this criminal, Jesus looked back over and not see him as a criminal, but he looked at him as a man. He looked at him as someone that was worth fighting for. He looked at him as someone that I got potential. He looked at him, it was someone that needed him. Even in the midst of his dying, Jesus looked back and saw this man, there was a sea and a saw going on. Jesus saw him, and the man sees Jesus woo, for who he is. We understand that the criminal did not understand all the things about the laws, but he understood the love of Jesus. Isn't that not right? We may not understand all the scripture in the Bible, but we do know that Jesus loves us. We may not understand every scripture, can remember everything, but one thing that we can remember, when Jesus saved our soul, he looked over and he saw, and he looked over and he responded. He looked over and he gave. He looked over and he forgave. He looked over and he gave a promise. Do you know today you got to just look over and see who Jesus is? If you love him, you just look over and say, Lord, I love you. You just look over, Lord, I believe you. You look over, Lord, I trust you. Hallelujah. We understand that this criminal got the the rolling carpet, got the roll out carpet. As we do, Jesus did not try to sort out all the things that he did. He did not try to figure out all the things that he could have done. But what he did, he looked within. Don't you believe, don't you understand that as we are up on, the, on our own crosses, Jesus is not looking at us, trying to keep us in our sins, but he's looking at the heart of each of us. He is restoring the heart and the soul, and he's not going to try to beat us down with the sins that we have committed. He looks at us in loving kindness, tender loving care. 
that we understand as we hang in our situations, we can just look over and see the love of Jesus. We can just look over, see the forgiveness of Jesus. Understand there are three words that you need to remember today about, oh, you shall be with me in paradise today. We shall be with Jesus. We are with Jesus right now. See who Jesus is. Understand that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Then look and see that we are to accept that which God has for us. He has this loving kindness and forgiveness. Receive it. Then we see, accept, oh hallelujah, and receive it. Receive the fact that you have eternal life with the Lord. Have forever life with the Lord. Now and forevermore. Praise God to the glory of God that we can look over and see. We can look over and understand that we are to what except we can look over and see that we can receive all that God has for us. Are you on the cross today? Or do you recognize that you have a Savior that wants to redeem you? Have you been hung up or have you hung somebody up? Have you looked at someone and said, you are not worthy of two dead flies because of you are he, you are she, you are them, you are they, you are whatever. You don't wear your hair right. You don't wear your shoes right. You're not in the right, on the right side of town. What, what, who have you hung up on the cross today? God said, look and see that there's forgiveness. Look and see and understand there is love. Look and see that all have fallen short of the glory of God and deserve an opportunity to do that which God has called them out to do. do. We, Jesus not only gave the criminal and given us a, a promise, but Jesus is the promise. We got a magnificent the promise. I got my promise. I got my promise. I praise God. Do you have your promise today? If you got your promise, say it with me. I got my promise. Say it again. I got my promise. Say it again. I got my promise. And that's a wrap. Dr. Holder, welcome back home. <laughs> We're going to send your letter over there to First Baptist and tell him you, you here now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Are you hung up or have you hung someone up? Today is a day of reflection too. We always want to be the women who went to the tomb, but some of us was in that crowd crying, crucify him. Thank you so much, Dr. Holder. Moving along, our next preacher, Reverend Dr. Winford Price, Jr., the newly installed pastor of the Beulah Baptist Church. Amen. He is a Morehouse brother and a scholar, a professor. He is doing wonderful things at Beulah, reviving the congregation, being active in that community. And, and we know that God has great things in store for him yet even to come as his ministry continues to expand, both among the young as well as the seasoned. His word today is, woman, behold thy son. Oh, thank you, Jesus, from John 19, 26, and 27. Let's give him a hand as he comes today. Might we unite our hearts in prayer. God, we thank you now for this preaching moment. We pray that you would have thine own way. Let the people see none of me and all of you. In your precious and holy name we pray. 
and every glad heart said amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, I would that you join me, protocol having already been established. God bless you, Pastor, for this gracious invitation. John chapter 19, as it is our custom as black church, I would, if you're physically able to stand and rest upon your feet with me, to the members of Beulah, God bless you for being here, and Ray of Hope. John chapter 19, beginning at verse 25. Meanwhile, standing near the foot of the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clophus and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple John, here is your mother. And from that hour, he took her into his own home. I want to emphasize this particular scripture. When Jesus saw his mother standing there, would you do me a favor and help me to preach today and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm still standing. You may take your seats. I want to preach from that thought today as I hang my hat upon that phrase, I'm still standing. In 1922, the scholar and the poet by the name of Langston Hughes put pen to parchment and wrote a well-known poem entitled Mother to Son. Some of you all may have learned this poem in grade school, and I dare not insult your intelligence, but if you have ever heard this poem by Langston Hughes, Mother to Son, it goes something like this. Mother Pitts, it says, Well, son, I'll tell you that life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor bare. But all the time, I've been a-climbing and reaching and landing and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light so boy don't you turn back now don't you set back on the steps cuz life finds you it's kind of hard don't you fall now for eyes still a going honey eyes still climbing and life for me ain't been no crystal stair somebody in this place today can identify with the mother in this poem because you too can testify that life for you ain't been no crystal stair and don't you fall back now she tells the son the mother in this poem tells her son and reminds him that life is no walk through the park it's no dash through the daisies it's no tiptoe through the tulips it's no run through the roses but rather it is filled with bumps and bruises and highs and lows and twists and turns and mountains and valleys and rivers and deserts and mountains and planks but all the time we keep on climbing and I'm just curious is there anybody in this space today who can testify, Brother Rice, I know what it's like to have to deal with some hardships and I can test to the fact that life for me ain't been no crystal stair. While the poem is entitled Mother to Son and there is a mother that is encouraging our son in our text today found in John 19 instead of the mother encouraging the son, it is the opposite of this inverse. It is a son who is now dealing with some crystal stairs and he is encouraging his mother. I like it because when we find Jesus in John chapter 19, we don't find a mother encouraging a son, but rather we find a son encouraging a mother. When we find Jesus in John 19, Jesus is hanging on an old rugged cross and the Bible says that he still speaks a word to his mother. I know church folk don't always know when to shout, so let me hit pause and rewind and do it one more time. When we find Jesus in chapter number 19, the Bible says that he's hanging on an old rugged cross, but somehow or another, he's still able to speak a word into somebody else's life. And this is ironic because of all the people that he speaks a word of comfort to, he speaks it to his mother. This is his mama. This is the one who raised him, and she realizes that life has not been a crystal stair. You do know the story of Mary. Mary has not been been born with a silver spoon in her mouth, but Mary has had some bumps and some bruises along the way. Walk through history, if you will, because you will remember that Mary was only 14 years old at the time of the Immaculate Conception, which means that she would have been a teenage mother growing up where? In Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Oh no, she's a teenage mother when she has Jesus. And the Bible says,
Bible says that her husband Joseph has died about a decade earlier in between 18 and 19 AD and as if that's not bad enough when her husband was alive they were fugitives running for the border trying to keep sweet baby Jesus safe I'm just trying to tell somebody today that she has not had it easy she grew up on the wrong side of the tracks and now she is watching the thing that she gave life to die right before her eyes she carried the one who is now carrying her she birthed him and raised him and fed him and nurtured him and loved him and supported him and cared for him and looked out for him y'all ain't saying nothing let me go scientific on you she is the one that has been taking care of Jesus after Joseph has died from the time that he was a fetus to a zygote to an embryo in the first and the second and the third trimester she has given life to Jesus and now she's watching her baby boy die on an old rugged cross all I'm trying to tell you is that life for Mary it ain't been no crystal stair she survived all of that and the text says now she is at the summit of Golgotha's brow she's hanging out with Jesus on Calvary but here's the blessing of the text friends with a crown of thorns pressed upon his head splintering the frontal lobe the peridial lobe and the optical lobe reducing his ability to see as drops of blood pour from the cavities of his vascular tissue with five inch spikes piercing through the transverse carpal the median nerve the carpal tunnel and the flexor tendons of his hands and with seven inch spikes puncturing through his feet through the metatarsal the lateral plantar nerve the tendons of his hand the medial plantar nerve and the deep perennial nerve his lungs are beginning to collapse as he gasps for breath and holds his body up saying today you will be with me in paradise the Bible says that now his abdomen muscles are beginning to decompress because the weight of the cross is compounded by the gravitational pull of the metaphysical universe and is pulling his body down which is now straining his heart and his aorta valve causing an electrical impulse to shoot down the axial nerve in his spine from his brain to his lips causing him to experience hypovolemic thirst and asphyxiation but the Bible says that he still speaks a word to his mother in the midst of everything that he had going on somehow or another Jesus was able to speak a word come here child of God the sign that you have grown up in God is when you can encourage somebody else in the midst of your own troubles the sign that you have grown up in God is when you can open up your mouth and say listen I know I got a lot going on but if you pray for me I'll pray for you if you shout for me that I'll shout for you is there anybody in this house who can testify regardless of what I'm going through I will learn how to encourage somebody else and the Bible says that Jesus speaks a word to his mother in spite of what he is dealing with. It is what the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls in some instances a Christless Christianity. That so many of us today are only concerned about me, myself, and I. Stop being selfish and arrogant in church and learn how to pray for somebody besides yourself. He, he's hanging on the cross. And the Bible says that he saw his mother still standing there. The text says in verse number 25, um, meanwhile, while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he saw his mother standing there, his mother who has been through her fair share of ups and downs. Mary and the other women, unlike the brothers, uh, unlike the men who have already deserted Jesus, according to Dolores Williams and Kelly Brown Douglas and Jacqueline Grant and other womanist theologians, the women stayed with Jesus all the way to the end. And the text says that they were standing near the cross as she watches her child take his last breath. I like that today because if you read your Bible carefully, there's one word in this text that blesses me. And that is at the beginning of verse 25, the text finds it not robbery to say, meanwhile. 
If you read your Bible carefully, what you will discover is that in the New Revised Standard Version, which is the most accurate transliteration of the text, that when the Bible says meanwhile, that denotes that two things are happening at the same time. If you hopscotch backward in this text, you will discover that while the women are standing there, the Bible says that the Roman soldiers and authority is also doing something at the same time. It says that they were casting lots on his clothes. They were scratching off tickets to see who was going to win the mega lotto. And the Bible says, meanwhile, the women were still standing. While the men were gambling, meanwhile, the women were grieving. While the men were laughing, meanwhile, the women were lamenting. And for somebody here today, you can testify that in the midst of everything that you've got going on, your testimony is meanwhile. In spite of everything that you have been through, meanwhile, I'm still standing. You may talk about me, but meanwhile, I'm still here. Is there anybody in this church who's got a meanwhile kind of testimony? You can lie on me all you want to. Meanwhile, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. And I just believe that today, during Women's History Month, there ought to be some sisters who can testify like the women in the text that I'm still standing in spite of everything that they had gone through. Their testimony was that I'm still standing in the midst of sexism. I'm still standing in the midst of patriarchy. I'm still standing in the midst of misogyny. I'm still standing in the midst of glass ceilings. I'm still standing in the midst of Donald Trump. I'm still, I dare somebody to open up your mouth and give them glory because you're still standing. As a matter of fact, Sealy said, I may be poor, I may be black, and I may be ugly, but here's your shout, I'm still here. Hello? Dearly beloved, you do realize that's the story of black women in America that black women have ha always had the ability to keep on standing in the midst of hard times. And every brother in this sanctuary ought to introduce your left hand to your right hand and clap like the devil's in between them because black women always know how to stand in the midst of difficult times. Can we give God praise today for the memory and the legacy of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Coretta Scott King and Mahalia Jackson and Dorothy Height? and Shirley Chisholm and Claudette Coven and Rosa Parks and Michelle Obama and Kamala Harris and Mamie Till and Sabrina Fulton and Nicki Minaj and Cardi B and Beyonce Church Girl don't hurt nobody I'm done. The Bible says that Jesus saw his mother standing there in the midst of everything that she had been through. And I like this because when you read John's gospel carefully, the only other place that you see Mary showing up is not in John 19 at Calvary, but it is in John chapter 2 at Canaan. You remember, if you moonwalk down memory lane, you will remember that when Jesus begins his ministry in chapter number 2 at the wedding of Cana, the Bible says that some of the saints got thirsty and they ran out of Pinot Noir. And so the Bible says that Jesus was able to suspend the liquidity of the water and to mess with the viscosity of the water and turn some water into wine and H2O into Hennessy and Dasani into Duce and Aquafina into Everclear. But not only was Mary there at the beginning, but Mary was there at the end because whoever you start with, no matter what you go through during your ministry, is who you're going to end with. And the reason that Mary says that I'm still standing is because when everybody else walked away, when everybody else gave up, Mary was still there. And aren't you glad, child of God, that in spite of everything you've been through, your testimony is that I'm still standing because God has been with me. God was with me in chapter 2, and God is with me in chapter 19. So no matter what comes my way, I can give God the glory and I can give God the praise because God will see me through. Is there anybody in this house who can open up your mouth and give them the glory? Like after everything that I've been through, what you've been through, I've been up and I've been down, almost leveled to the ground. But after everything that I've been through, I still got my joy. I still got my strength. I still got my praise. And I still got my right mind. Would
Would you shake one neighbor's hand uh, and don't hold that hand uh, like a dead fish, uh, but hold that hand uh, like you got power. Uh, hold that hand uh, like you mean business uh, and say, neighbor, uh, after everything uh, that I've been through, uh, God uh, has seen me through. Uh, cry all you want to. Uh, shout all you want to. Uh, but God will uh, take care uh, of you uh, beneath his wings uh, of love abide. Uh, God will. Oh, come on, let's bless the Lord. Let's bless the Lord. Come on, let's bless the Lord. I'm still standing. I, I, didn't I see some Beulah members in here? Y'all just wait, just raise your hand real quick. The Beulah members, I'm just, I'm just gonna say this. I'm just gonna say this. I know you take care of your pastor. I know you blessing him beyond measure. But whatever you pay in him, you still need to raise it. Let me just let that sit in the atmosphere. You have a gift from God. To cherish that gift. Thank you, my Morehouse brother. That's, that's how we do it at Morehouse, y'all. Amen. Our next preacher, the Reverend Dr. David Hopewell, one of our own here at Green Forest. He is our minister of visitation. He has been a professor at the Beulah Heights uh, uh, Bible College. Uh, he is an evangelist. He is an author. And he is a teacher and a lover of God. What I love most about him, he's on fire for Jesus. Amen. And we look forward to him sharing with us today as he comes with the word. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Would you give the Lord a hand of praise as he comes? Eli, Eli, Lama Sabathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, God? Have you forsaken me? I propose to you that God takes all of us through the seasons of life to prepare us for our earthly assignments. Did you not know we all have an assignment from God? <laughs> we see Jesus here in this text, Mark, four, Mark chapter 15, verse number 34. The ninth hour, crying out, Eli, Eli, why hast thou forgotten me? Mm. Yet we must remember that this was God in the flesh. So let's talk about the fleshly side of Jesus, the human side. As a man, perhaps he didn't know that he was going to suffer to this extent or experience separation from God. Yet to help us, the Bible says at all points, he was tempted like we are. Yet he didn't indulge. He experienced everything you and I experience. <laughs> Did you not know this was his assignment? And just like him, God gives all of us an assignment. In addition, God takes us all through a process to prepare us for that assignment. We all pass through a springtime, a summer, a fall, then a winter. I'll get back to the winter because right now in this text, Jesus is in his winter. But it's interesting that usually when we get a call, especially those who are in pulpit ministry, 
uh, we first need to realize that the call is different from the assignment. The call is God summonsing you. And when you answer, here I am, then God says, go do this. That's the assignment. But it's interesting that the first thing usually that we do, and I know that there are people in the pews, that you're in, I want you to understand this is not just the, this is for every one of us in here today, that you have an assignment. But it's interesting that those that do usually go to uh, some kind of way to prepare for your assignment, whether it's a business or whatever it is you prepare. And I know as a clergy, usually the first thing we do is we go to a university or somewhere to get an education. And so whereas you and I perhaps have been to the University of Man, the question is, have you and I been to the University of God? The University of God is on the backside of the desert. You must remember that Moses had all the education of Egypt, but he still had to go to the University of God on the backside of the desert. Paul trained on the Camille, but Paul still was found in the wilderness. Mm. Wow. Jesus, were the scribes and Pharisees in the temple, all of that, but still he spent time in the university of God in the wilderness. Whew. My God, my God. Don't miss what God is saying to us today. The wilderness, the universe of God, according to Deuteronomy chapter 8, is a place that God himself has chosen to prove what's in you and my heart, whether we will serve him or not. And the Bible said that God allows all these things to occur because what he's trying to get to us to do is, is come to a place that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I hate to say it, but some have opted out the process. There's a process that God takes all of us through. A springtime, a summer, a fall, and a winter. The question is, have you and I opted out of the process? And it's easier for me to identify those in clergy as I travel the country and I deal with pastors and some of them are so full of pride and arrogance and I, and I understand you're proud and I'm proud, I've got diplomas and all those things, but walking around with a sense of pride when God's looking for the fragrance of brokenness. When you and I get to the point that we don't want it anymore, like Moses in the desert, that's just about when God's getting ready to release you into your assignment. When we look at the life of Jesus, we can see these four seasons. Wow. The natural seasons and the spiritual seasons. It was in Jesus' springtime that he was born. Lord have mercy. When you plant something, it was those who became before him that prophesied a savior would come. A seed was planted. And in the springtime, it grew. The child was foretold. The seed was planted. The angels announced. The shepherds announced. Jesus presented himself in the temples. He visited the Magi. The Magi came, and they honored this child, Jesus. Jesus was in the temple at the age of 12. In the springtime, he was baptized. In the springtime, he birthed his ministry. Springtime ministry, he started a ministry. Springtime in ministry. Then we see that not only those things have, and, and most of the time, amen, I mean, I'm, 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 you know, this was springtime. Get that, the beginning of something. But then we come to the hot trials and the testings of life in the summer. The summer is when it's hot. I mean, a lot of, some of us don't like summer. We try to get in the air condition and all that kind of stuff, but God has chosen the summer. Wow. It was during this time in the summer that it's interesting that, and, and let me just state this, that in God's university, 
you can find a pattern or the matriculation in Deuteronomy chapter number one. Remember, they were in Egypt and they had learned all the things of the Egyptians. And now God was taking them on a 12 days journey to enter into the promised land. You must understand that from Mount Horeb to Canis Barnea, it was an 11 days journey. 11 means the in number of imperfection. One more day, number 12, which means governmental authority of rule, they would have been with God in authority in the promised land. They would have graduated. When Moses went up to there and got the law or got the textbooks, he came down as a professor to give them the text with the curriculum, and they chose to disobey and, 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 and would not do what God told them to do. And a 12 days journey cost them 40 years. That's a lot of staying after school. I, I, I mean, that's a lot. I mean, you could have graduated, but you're still in school 40 years later. The number 11, imperfection. When you could have been in the promised land, cost you another 40 years wandering in the world. And the word Canish Barnea, part of that word means to be holy. You were in a state, but you never completed it. Now you're going to school on a walker. Now you got a cane. You got your hearing aid. You can't hear any longer. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> what Jesus experienced during his summer, he told his disciples all the things that he would be experience, the hot trials of life. He experienced the Gentiles mocking him, the shameful treatment he was spit upon. Lord have mercy. Various encounters with the Jewish leaders, he was in, on trial six times. They chose Barabbas instead of Jesus. He experienced all these trials during the hot summer of life. What season are you in? Then we come to the season of fall. Fall is when that which is, is hidden cannot be seen. Like you can't see the trees, branches because of the leaves. But then fall also is when that falls on that which was seen is now hidden. Mm. Amazing. The fall. It's those things that you and I have on our heart that are hidden, that no one knows about, that we think that are hidden. What is in God saying, what is in your heart that God keeps telling you to dethrone? because it's sitting in the place that's only reserved for him, but you and I refuse to dethrone it. So the question is, when Jesus in this text, what was on Jesus's heart? As a man, I mean, maybe he thought, I mean, I mean God, I mean, I knew I was supposed to die for the people. I knew that, you know, I, I, but, but, but all, I didn't know all of this. I didn't know all this was gonna happen. <laughs> Agonizing the garment in the garden. Listen to this. I knew they were going to, I didn't know all this. They persecuted him. Luke 21 12. Denied Peter, his own denied him. The Sanhedrin plotted against him. They arrested him. They slapped him on his face. They accused him falsely and blasphemed. They placed him on trial. They lied upon him. The scribes and the Pharisees always were after him. They mocked him. Those he came to redeem preferred Barabbas as opposed to him. They stripped his garment, cast lots on them in the roll. They whipped him 39 stripes. They gave him vinegar to drink instead of water. He was made to carry his own cross. They pierced him in his side. They placed a crown of thorns upon his head. And many of us know the New Testament scriptures, but we don't know the Old Testament scriptures. Let me just share some with you. Psalms 22 says, as it was prophetic, the psalmist, amen, echoing what Jesus would be saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you don't hear me. I cry in the night, but you're silent. But thou art holy, thou, O who then habits the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted in thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. 
but I am a worm, a no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. Oh my God, all they that see me, this is Jesus, song, all they that see me laughed to scorn. They shout up at me with the lips. They shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him now, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me the hope upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God and from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is no help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Basham have beset me round about. They grab upon me with their mouth. As a raven and roaring lion, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Not broken, but all my bones are out of joint. And listen to this. For they look and stare at me. He could see his own bones. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my lip jaws. Thou that brought me into this dust of this death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked is enclosed. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones for they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But not thou be not far from me, O God. Mm. In the fall, everything around him now was declining. Everything around him now was leaving. God, I, 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 I knew you called me for this. I knew you called, but God, I didn't know it was going to take all this. I want you to understand that when you and I, I had an anxiousness to preach, Pastor. I had an anxiousness to go around. I had an, but I don't have an anxiousness no more. But once you have been in where I'm going next winter, when you become to a winter, Lord have mercy. Mm, mm, mm. Winter is death. And just like there's a physical gift, God's looking for a spiritual one. Where we would die to our flesh. You and I don't understand. And I really believe that most of us probably are stuck in fall. That we're stuck at the place where God's trying to move us and dethrone what's on our heart so that we can grow. But you refuse to do so, and so you stay in what they were, the children of Israel, 11 days journey, that's an imperfection, or you stay in an arrested development state. You live in an adult's body, but still act like a child. And God's trying to say, grow up, because just like Jesus in his winter, just like Jesus in his spring and his fall, if Jesus had not submitted to the winter of his life, we would not have salvation today. Perhaps you are in a season of winter. God takes all of us through the same seasons. I want you to understand that Joseph was in a season. When I say, when I give you these biblical characters, I want you to understand that it's winter is a place of isolation. Isolation is a place where heaven becomes silent. Jesus was in his winter on the cross because heaven was silent. He's crying out to his father, and all of a sudden, God's not saying anything. He's in his winter when heaven becomes silent. Will you and I opt out the process, or will we trust God? You and I, are we crying out, Eli, Eli, God, why have you forsaken me? Remember Joseph. He was in a pit, and he was in prison, isolated in a place where his prayers weren't being heard. Remember Job, who's in the belly of a whale, in isolation. Who can help me now? I'm in isolation. And as I'm thinking to you about Moses, who's in a place of isolation in the desert, you must understand one thing about God and the university of God, that God brings you to a place of isolation. So there's only a dependency upon him, so then he can only get the glory. When you don't want it, God's getting ready to release you in it. But you know that you can't do it. And you yourself sometimes are crying out, God, I would rather leave here physically because I can't do it. 
There's an Elijah who was hid in the cave and Jesus upon the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, oh God? Maybe you today are like Joseph that's in a prison. Maybe you are in the belly of a whale. Maybe you are like Moses hid in the mountain in the wilderness. Maybe you're Elijah hid in the cave. Maybe you're Jesus. Maybe you have cried out yourself, my God, my God, why are you allowing me to go through all of this? And I want to tell you, you have it all on your heart against God. Jeremiah chapter 16, God told Jeremiah, I heard you the first day you called me, but you called me a liar. Some of us have an all in our heart against God because he's not coming the time we've allowed it him. And I want to let you know today that God said repent this day. And then in the midst of your situation, just like Jeremiah, you've got to discern the activity in the midst of your circumstance. In your circumstances, worship God, praise God. But first of all, ask God to forgive you. I wonder today if there's somebody today that's got an all on your heart today. You need a man to ask God to forgive you and ask God to come in and rest in him because it's not Eli, Eli, Lama Sabathana. But I want to let you know that springtime is here. That springtime is here. And just around the corner, Lord have mercy, that which has been planted in seed form, it shall come to pass. My, 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 my. What season are you in now? My, my, my. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hopewell, for the powerful word. We'll have a solo by our own, uh, Sister Ashley Pearson. Amen.
his father. Oh, he's calling his father. to the Lord? Haven't we been blessed? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, beloved, we're going to continue in this worship experience through the giving of our financial resources. We know that we cannot buy salvation because that's a free gift. And Jesus has paid the price. But we can sow into the kingdom of God that his ministry will continue. So let us pray. Father God, we bless your name today, God. We come with our hearts filled with thanksgiving, God. Thanking you first, oh God, for your son Jesus, oh God, who died for our sins. God, we thank you for this free gift Oh God, that you've given us, oh Lord Jesus. And now, God, as we come now, Lord God, we want to bless the name of the Lord through the givings of our monetary gifts, oh God, that you will be glorified, oh God, that your kingdom, oh God, will continue, oh Lord, and that ministry will be done. So, God, we thank you now, Lord God, as we give. Oh, Lord God, with a cheerful spirit, oh God, because your word teaches us that God loves a cheerful giver. So, God, we now ask, oh God, that you will receive these gifts, oh Lord God, and that you will multiply it, oh God, that it, oh Lord God, would be a blessing to many, God. Bless it as only you can in the wonderful name of Jesus, who is our Lord the risen Savior. In Jesus' name, we extend these gifts to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.
Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Sister Ashley, for that beautiful solo. Uh, to Reverend Fowler, we thank you for your participation on our pulpit today. You all, we are coming down the stretch, and we are getting closer and closer. This time, I have the privilege of introducing uh, someone I've recently met, but I have followed his ministry for some time, the Reverend Dr. Addison Kennedy of the Mount Zion Second Baptist Church. Oh, we see how much you love him. <laughs> his preaching ministry has taken him across the country, preaching in pulpits, both large and small. He is an ITC brother as well, and he is newly installed at Mount Zion and doing an amazing work in the city and in that community, and he's been preaching all across the city as well, blessing hearts and minds and soul, and we know he has a word for us today as he comes with the simple I thirst. Could we give God a hand of praise as he comes? Shall we pray? Dear God, we thank you for an opportunity to commemorate what it is that you did on Calvary. So God, even right now, we thank you. We love you. Speak now. Allow me to be your preacher. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Protocol having already been established, I thank God for uh, Green Forest's pastor. Can we thank God for the angel of this house, the visionary? We thank God. Raven Dr. Waters, I thank God for him and all the other uh, preachers and clergy, men and women uh, that are here today. Thank you so very much. John chapter 19, uh, starting with the 28th verse, it says this, after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. I just want to preach simply, I thirst, I, I thirst, I thirst. You may be seated in the presence of God. The Apostle John links Jesus' statements, I thirst, statement, I thirst, to the fulfillment of Scripture. There were, in fact, at least 20 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled during the 24 hours surrounding our Savior's death by highlighting how Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled throughout Jesus' crucifixion, John showed that everything that was happening was happening according to the plan of God. However, it doesn't just show us the infallibility of God's plan. It shows us the capacity, the competency, the capability of God's plan. I understand at this point in time, Jesus has been betrayed by Judas, arrested by soldiers, denied by Peter, struck by police, questioned by Pilate, sentenced by people, flogged, tortured, and mocked by soldiers, and ultimately crucified for others to see. And yet, the text says, in order to fulfill scripture, Jesus says, I am thirsty. <laughs> in this word, here's the first thing that this word teaches us. It teaches us, it communicates the stamina of scripture. 
What endurance, what resilience, what vitality we see here after going through such, agon such an agonizing experience just to muster up enough energy, not just to say I thirst, but to say I thirst so it follows and fulfills the scriptures. I like that, my brothers and sisters, because it suggests to us, my brothers and sisters, that nothing and no one can stop scripture from being fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, nothing, y'all, can stop scripture. Nothing can halt scripture. Nothing can block scripture. Nothing can intercept scripture. Nothing can suspend scripture. Nothing can disrupt scripture from being fulfilled. And I'm here today to tell you, my brothers and sisters, you ought to be able to be thankful even right now that not even you can stop scripture from being fulfilled in your life. Jesus shows us Jesus shows us uh, that, yeah, you might be strong enough to strike me. You might be bold enough to whip me. You might be crazy enough to betray me. You might be trifling enough to, to even deny me. You might even be powerful enough to crucify me. But there's one thing you can't do. It stops scripture from being fulfilled. Can I submit to you? Can I submit to you, my brothers and sisters? Uh, I like that because that's something to be thankful for. Uh, that no matter how difficult, how arduous, how burdensome, how challenging, how problematic, how painful, how strenuous, how troublesome things may get, the scripture still got to be fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, because scripture even tells us that the grass withered. The flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I wish I had some Bible readers out there. So can I encourage you today? Can I encourage you when you're going through your times of sickness, times of trouble, times of pain, times of issues? Here's what I want you to do. After you quote your favorite scripture to help you go through what it is that you're going through, just say it has to be fulfilled. What, what's your favorite sir? What's your favorite scripture? He that began a good work in you shall complete it and perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It has to be fulfilled. No weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises, God shall condemn. It has to be fulfilled. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. It has to be fulfilled. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. It has to be fulfilled. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It has to be. It, it has to be fulfilled. Here it is. Here it is. Not only uh, does this word, I thirst, communicate the stamina of Scripture, but here it is, and I'm done. I'm out of your way. Uh, it tells us, it tells us, this statement prepares us for the success of salvation. I thank God for my church being here today. I thank God for Mount Zion Second Baptist. Uh, a few of my members being here today. Thank you so very much. But here's what it does. It prepares us for the success of salvation. According to an old tradition, respected uh, women of Jerusalem would provide a narcotic drink to those condemned to death in order to decrease their sensitivity to the excruciating pain. When Jesus arrived at Golgotha, he was offered this same narcotic drink. It's wine mixed with myrrh, but he refused it, choosing to endure the full consciousness of the suffering that was appointed to him. But this time, but, but this time, uh, this time in particular, Jesus makes a statement of thirst. 
and they give him what we find to be not a narcotic drink, but we find that they give him sour wine. Oh, okay, um, uh, the Greek word that is translated as sour wine is oxus. Um, this Greek word refer refers to cheap and sour wine that was apparently not purchased by the wealthy people of the day. Uh, it was a sharp vinegary wine. It, it, it was common wine used to simply quench thirst. Oh my God, I'm, I'm about to shout because uh, I know what I'm about to say. Um, uh, so, so a sour wine vinegar is mentioned in the Old Testament as a refreshing drink. In Greek and Roman literature, it was a common beverage appreciated by laborers and soldiers because it relieved thirst more effectively than water. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Because oftentimes... Those that are crucified are suffering not just from physical pain and physical trauma, they're also feeling the effects of dehydration. Uh, so sometimes the dehydration of those being crucified will be so severe, it could be the primary cause of someone's death outside of the physical trauma that they were going through. But, but, but I, I got something to tell you. Huh. Jesus says, I thirst on the fifth word. But there's seven words from the cross. So when Jesus says, I thirst, when you subtract seven, uh, seven minus five equals two, meaning that there's more to say. There's more for Jesus to say from the cross. So in order for him to prepare to say what he's going to say later, he says, I thirst so that he doesn't die too soon. Okay. So, so to ensure that he's not going to die too soon, Jesus says, I thirst that, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Because y'all understand, Jesus even said, ain't nobody going to take my life. I lay my own life down on my one accord. You're not going to allow dehydration to be the cause of my death. So he says, I thirst. Because he has more to say. Huh, I like that. He says, I thirst so that he can delay his own death. He, he, he says, I thirst so that he can wet his beak. He says, I thirst so that he can lubricate his vocal cords and rehydrate his body because he had more to say. This is adjacent to an athlete taking a timeout in the middle of a game right before the fourth quarter in order to give him the energy he needs to continue and finish the game he's playing. This is like a runner uh, taking a pause from their mile long run just to be able to take a drink so that they can finish the run that they are on. This is like a boxer going to his corner and getting some water so that he can finish the 11th and 12th round. It's like a preacher taking a, uh, taking a drink right before he closes a sermon. And I'm here today to tell you, my brothers and sisters, if you're going through a time where where it seems like Jesus ain't saying nothing. Where it feels like Jesus ain't saying what you want him to say in this season. Don't trip. Don't get worried because he might just be taking a break because he has more to say. Now I can't tell you what the other preachers are going to preach about after me, but just know there's more to say. can't tell you what they're going to preach about but is there anybody out there that can thank God that there's more to say when you look back over your life in those times of silence you can thank God that he still had more to say he said something that was able to change your life and give you the victory that was coming your way he says I, I, sir, I thirst because he recognizes there's more to say.
and there is more to say. <laughs> Thank, oh my God, thank you so much for that word. Thank you so much for that word. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus. This next preacher, Reverend Pastor Camille Holmes, uh, he has been my brother, my friend for over 26 years. He preached my ordination service. He has counseled me through many, many trying times. He was there for me when I lost loved ones, when my mother died when my brothers died, when my own child died. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the proud pastor of New Hope Baptist Church in downtown Atlanta. You've already seen God has gifted him with a vocal ability to sing and bless us in song, but he also is a preacher. And we ask that you put your hands together for the Lord as he comes to bless us with his word today. Hallelujah. It is finished. John 19 and 30, when therefore, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, finish what you start. Of the last sayings of Christ on the cross, it is finished is the finale of the events that took place on Good Friday. Found only in the Gospel of John, the Greek translation for it is finished is tetelestai. According terms, that means paid in full. When Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring that the debt owed by mankind, not the debt owed by him, but the debt owed by mankind, the debt of sin had been eliminated. The debt of sin had been paid in full. And to pick it back on what the pastor just said, also for the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, symbols and foreshadowing the coming of the Messiah had also been completed. From the seed who was crushed by the serpent's head that is mentioned in Genesis 3 and 15 to the suffering servant that's mentioned in Isaiah 53 spoke about to the prediction of the Messiah coming by John the Baptist who prepared the way for our Messiah all the prophecies of Jesus' life, ministry's death were fulfilled and finished at the cross. It is finished. It was a common word in that society. It was used by a slave who had completed an assignment given to him by his master, he will report back, step back, and say it is finished. It was used by an artist who had completed work on a painting. He will step back and say it is finished. It was used by merchants who had sold merchandise on credit. When the bills had been paid in full, he would write in his ledger testalistai, which means it is finished. It is used by you and I when we get something done, it is finished. It is real sad that so many of us start stuff and do not finish it. So many of us have started college and allowed situations and circumstances to cause us to drop out. So many of us have started high school and caused situations and circumstances to allow us to drop out. So many have started businesses and allowed situations and circumstances to cause you to quit. But if you hold on to God's unchanging hand and understand, as the preacher says, sometimes we will go through some stuff. Sometimes we will have to take a break. Sometimes we will get thirsty. Sometimes we will have to stop and let God be God, but if you have the desire to finish, no matter hell or high water, no matter what you are going through, if you have the desire to finish, you will finish. Let's look at what took 
place and what these words that came from our Savior's lip mean, it is finished. First of all, the validation of the prophetic scripture was fulfilled. He had fulfilled every prophecy about him when he said it is finished. Second of all, not only did the validation of the prophetic scripture was fulfilled, second of all, the termination of his personal suffering was finished. His suffering had complete. I understand the Bible says Job suffered, Paul suffered, John suffered while on the Isles of Patmos. You have suffered, I have suffered, and so many of us are still suffering. But let me tell you something, none of us have suffered like Jesus. I wish I had a witness. He was wounded, he bore stripes, and he suffered horrible scars. He suffered, but at this time, when he said it is finished, his suffering was complete. And let me tell you how he suffered. He suffered voluntarily because he did not, none of us look forward to suffering, but all of us will suffer. But Jesus volunteered to suffer for our life. He laid down his life. His life was not taken from him. He willingly laid down his life. He said, I gave it because I believe that what I'm doing is the best thing for all mankind. Is there anybody in here other than me who can say, I'm so glad that he gave up his life for me because I realized I could not die that death on the cross. I could not bear that cross like he did. So Lord, I thank you that you suffered voluntarily. Not only did he suffer voluntarily, but he suffered victoriously, which means he was not defeated at the cross, but he was victorious on the cross. I wish I had somebody. He suffered to redeem us from sin. The men beat him. They plucked his beard. They spit on him. They left him and they whooped him. Gave him 195 stripes on him. He suffered physically. He suffered emotionally. He suffered spiritually. He suffered pain that no one ever has suffered. And before he died, he said, it is finished. He did not allow them to take his life, but he gave up his life. The nail didn't keep him on the cross, but love kept him on the cross. Can I give you a mathematical problem that a lot of us are to shout about? One Savior plus three nails equals forgiven. I wish I had somebody who can say, I'm so glad that he decided not to come down off the cross. He could have called angels. He could have called his father, but he stayed there for you and I. Third of all, the domination of the power of Satan was now in his hands. Satan has no power over us. The only power he has is the power that we give him. And at Calvary, Satan was finished whether he liked it or not. Finally, the culmination of a perfect salvation is now in place because I don't care what none of us do. None of us can be successful without the salvation and the grace of God. Am I right about it? No matter what we go through, we all need salvation and we all need God's grace. Who in there know they need the grace of God? Paul said in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, basically, Jesus' cross had been bared. His assignment has been completed. His race had been ran. The saints of old used to sing a song that says all of God's children got a race to run. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us and let us run this race with patience looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame sat down at the right hand of the throne of God everything had been completed pastor when he said it is finished Sickness had been healed. Hungry bellies had been filled. Blinded eyes had been opened. Deaf ears had been cleared. Non-believers had been converted. Miracles had been performed. Traditions had been broken. He even stopped dying long enough to save an uh, unsaved thief. Everything had been complete. The price of sin had been paid. His race had been run. Everything had been finished. I wish I had a witness. And when I think about a race that's been run, it takes me back to May 24th. 
1988, my senior year in high school in a PE class when Coach Ernest Davis said 60% of your grade depends on running a mile. I know y'all see where I'm going with this. And it was me and another brother in the PE class that had unique figures. Can I preach up in this place? And the coach looked at me and said, Camille, I need to see you after class because if you don't pass the final exam, you will not pass the class. He said, I understand your situation. He looked at me, smiled. I understand your situation. So to keep you from embarrassing yourself, I'm going to allow you and Mike to write a paper so that y'all don't have to run the mile. Mike said, thank you, coach. I said, let me get back with you. On my way home, I had my head down. And how many of y'all know that a drug addict can encourage you? Can I preach up in here? A drug addict by the name of Kenny said, boy, what's wrong with you? I said, I want to run the mile, but I'm afraid I might not be able to finish it. He said, let me tell you something, son. You ain't trying to win. You just trying to finish the race. Can I preach up in here? All you got to do is pace yourself. You ain't trying to impress nobody. Just finish that race. I went to school the next morning, preacher, with a smile on my face. Because they were like, are you going to write the paper? I said, no, coach, I'm going to run the mile. They put all the athletes in front of me. Everybody started laughing. They said, ain't no way that fat boy is going to run four laps around this track without that monkey getting on his back. We got down in our stance. He said, on your mark. Get sad. He sounded the gun. Everybody else took out fast, but I got me a little trot going. I wish I had a witness. I kept on trotting. I kept on trotting. They laughed me. They were laughing at me, but I kept on trotting. Somebody pointed at me and said he ain't gonna make it, but I kept on trotting. Two laps went. I kept on trotting. Everybody else was finished. Three laps went, but I kept on trotting. On the last lap, Priester, I got real tired. I wish I had some vinegar, cause I was showing up thirsty. But I kept on trying. Somebody said, come on, Camille. You can do it. That trot turned into a sprint. When I rode around the corner, they said, Camille, just keep on running. I got the sprint real fast. When I crossed the finish line, I looked at my coach. I said, the Bible teaches us that the race is not given to the swift but oh to the one that endureth until the end just jump on your feet real quick this is a good moment right here but somebody that's still trotting, come on, get on your feet real quick and say, I'm still trotting for Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yeah! They're still trotting for Jesus. It's not finished. You got more to run. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You keep on in here, we're gonna have something let loose. Thank you, Pastor Holmes. Thank you, Jesus. It is finished. But he had one more word. He's no stranger to any of us. Pastor Marlon Harris, pastor of the New Life Church. 
He is a preacher's preacher. He is a pastor to pastors. He is a leader in this city and his ministry extends globally. He has impacted the lives of thousands locally and millions globally. He has been such a humble servant of God. Through it all as God continues to elevate him and use him as a model of how ministry is supposed to impact more than just the inside of the four walls of the church. When I first got to the neighborhood, I just drove around. I just wanted to get to know this area. And I went by this church and I said, my God, whose church is that? It had new life on it. I immediately went home, got online, and I knew Pastor Harris, but I didn't know his church. And to see what God is doing through that ministry and life is a testament to what God can do when you're faithful over a few things, he'll make you ruler over many. Can we put our hands together as he comes today? With Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's it. And all the people said amen. amen. And amen again. Man, I love preaching. And we have had some amazing preaching being done. I want to give thanks to uh, Dr. Christopher Waters for this very kind and generous invitation to come and uh, just give me sermons for the rest of the year. I want all of these preachers to know that I intend to plagiarize all of your sermons. Every last one of them, I intend to do that. That's, that's, why, that's why I accepted. I said, you have six preachers before me? I know I'm going. That's six free sermons. I, I, I can't say no. Amen, 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 amen. I want to thank God for all of these, my colleagues in ministry. We have heard some of the finest in rhetorical homiletics that I believe you can hear. And so my task is simple. I do not need to homiletically speak hard. I really want to take off the rhetorical hat and put on the hat of a pastor. And I want us to listen to the words of this last phrase of Jesus. It's the last phrase of Christ on earth and it is the first phrase that rings from his eternity. It says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. He speaks and he says in verse 45 and verse 46, the sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was rent in the midst and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I just want to talk about the last committal. The last committal. One of the sad honors that we have as pastors is to preside over the funerals of our members. In my short tenure, I have presided over far many than I want to remember. Hundreds of loving, good people I've had to give eulogies for. Hundreds of caskets and I've had to see loaded into hearses and I've had to follow behind them to a graveyard. 
And when we get there, we say the things we were taught in school and the things we have learned from our tradition. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and earth to earth. It's our tradition to commit the body to the ground. Jesus gives us the first committal of the New Testament. The first committal of the Old Testament was when God committed the body of Adam. And he did it prehumously to the ground. And he says, from dust you are, and from dust you shall return. And in the Old Testament, God spoke eulogistically over Adam's life before his death and said, Adam, your body shall return to the dirt from whence I made it. And that is the old covenant of a committal of the body. This is not that. This is not a committal of the body. This is the committal of the Spirit. There's no mention in this word of the body. The body is not relegated here in this word. In the first six words, there was an earthly theme attached to them, and the body was significant. Nails in his hands, forgive them, for they know not what they do watching over the care and the concern of his mother and saying, behold your son, son behold your mother. Looking at the emaciated facade that he has over his face and the countenance he carries, the weight of sin on him, he thirsts physically in his body. In his body, he declares, even in the midst of excruciating pain, it is finished. But here in this word, it's not about the body. This word, he is committing his spirit. This is critical and has been used as a long-standing controversy. It's a controversy of the Gnostics who would say that there is this duality of flesh and spirit, matter and immaterial, that which is metaphysical and that which is physical. There is this duality between the two, and the Gnostics would have us to believe that the body, the matter, those things that are material are insignificant, have no spiritual weight, no spiritual value, that they don't have any spiritual context related to them. All that matters is the spirit. All that matters is the immaterial, and all that matters is the metaphysical. It was Pliny the Younger who speaks and tries to give some clarity to this whole Gnostic phenomenon, and he tries to blend together this whole spirit and flesh, this spirit and body duality, this disagreement that theologians have had throughout the annals of the early Christian church. It was Karl Barth, though. Karl Barth spoke and he gave us a clearer understanding that there really isn't a division between flesh and spirit, but rather there is an emphasis placed upon the function of each, that your body has a function and your spirit has a function. And for a period of time, God allows the body and the spirit to coexist in the same locale. And within the context of humanity, body and spirit come together and they live together having individual functions. And at the moment of death, the body and the spirit, they dissolve from each other. And the body goes to the ground and the spirit goes to God. And I believe Barth was right in what he was saying, but that's not what's happening here. Jesus is not speaking about his body at all because his body is not the one that needs committing. The body of Jesus is going to come back to life again. You don't commit a body to the ground when it's not going to decay. You don't commit a body to the ground when it will not be eaten by worms. 
You don't commit a body to the ground when it's not going to suffer rigor mortis. You don't commit a body to the ground that is not going to suffer the atrophy of its muscles and the declension of its sinews and the deterioration of its skin. When a body has no damage and no danger of rotting in a grave, there's no need to commit it to the ground. We commit the body of our loved ones to the ground because we understand that they are going to suffer rot. We know that they're going to suffer rot for years and years should the Lord tarry. So we commit their body to the ground in an expectation that their body is going to need to be remolecularized and put back together again at the resurrection. But Jesus did not need such a committal because his body would not see any destruction. His body was only going to spend three days in the ground. His body was not going to be there long enough for the oxidation process to begin. His body was not going to be there long enough for the skin to begin rotting from the flesh. His body was not going to be there long enough for the muscles to lose their animation. His body was not going to be there long enough for the brain to find its way into atrophy and his, his sinews to find its way into decline. He was only going to be buried for three days. So much that his body not need a committal that he didn't even buy a plot for himself. He bought a plot, he got a plot rather, from Joseph of Arimathea. It was a borrowed tomb, a tomb that somebody else had because he had no intentions on keeping it long. Can I get a witness here? The body was not what was of his concern. The concern was his spirit. The concern was that part of him that was in direct, undiluted oneness with the Father, his spirit. That part of him that had all of God wrapped into it where he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, his spirit. And he says, into your hands, I commend, I commend my spirit. The Greek word for a commend is actually the word that means to put into safekeeping. To keep safe from harm and from danger. Uh, for committing, commending his spirit to the Father, he is saying, I'm giving you my spirit so that when the time is right, you can send the spirit back to the body and the body will rise again. He put in the hands of his father his spirit. I want to know, have you put in the hands of God your spirit? Have you placed your spirit in his hands? Have you placed that part of you that lives outside of you, that part of you that lives transcendent of you? Have you placed your spirit in the hands of the Father? We see on the cross this emaciating, this, this excruciating event. When the son is dying on the cross, his heart literally splits. His nerve endings are finding their fullest expression of pain. We find that the nails in his hands and in his feet have made it hard for him to buttress himself up against the cross. Because of the slump and the weight of his body, his lungs begin filling up with, with water and he's finding it difficult to breathe. He has early onset pneumonia as he recognizes and realizes the heart swells with the water that's coming from his lungs and he cannot catch a breath unless he can straighten himself and he has to straighten himself by pressing down upon the nails in his feet and between those bones in his feet where the nails are driven he has to put the full weight of his body on those nails and lift himself just to catch a breath and when every other man would have been concerned about the body he was concerned about his spirit 
That's a word for us today. That when you are concerned about the flesh, when you're concerned about the things of this world that have no eternal value, the things of this world that do not last forever, the things of this world that pass away, when you're concerned about the flesh, you should be concerned about the spirit. I know you're concerned about the food you're going to eat. I know you're concerned about the money that you need for bills and expenses, but you should be concerned about the spirit. I know you're concerned about the natural things of this life, the bills, the burdens, the problems, the weight of the world, but you should be concerned about the spirit. I know it weighs heavy on you. Your mind is perplexed with things that don't have eternal value. We toss and turn in the midnight hour and stay awake all night thinking about things that affect the body but the body is wasting away the body is not going to stand the body is not your dilemma the body is not your concern the body is not your deepest worry the body is not your heaviest anxiety the body is not your greatest stress your greatest anxiety your heaviest worry your deepest concern is what is going to happen with my spirit what is going to happen with the spirit that God has given to me. And Jesus, when dying on the cross, he turns his attention to that eternal aspect of his life. And he focuses on his spirit. Are you focused on your spirit? Are you focused on the eternal condition of your soul have you fixed it with God so that when your body does expire your spirit has a home to go to have you determined that there is something of more value to you than just the body but there is a part of you that is in communion with God and that part of you is what is most significant in your life's experiences. Have you fixed it with your soul? Have you gotten forgiveness for your sins? Have you gotten cleansed for your iniquities? Have you been changed by the blood of Jesus? Can I get a witness here? He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, there are several things I want you to capture and then I'll take my seat. The first thing is that he refers to God as his father. It was in the previous words that he referred to God as God. When he cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, he referred to God as God. He used the formal and uh, he used the formal phrase for God. He called him by his formal title. But in this cry, he does not call him God. He does not call him by some aloof deity term. He calls him Father. He recognizes the personal relationship that he has with God, and he calls him Father. The Greek word pater, it comes from even the Aramaic root, or the Aramaic transliteration, rather, of Abba, which means dad, which means he who is close to me, he who is close by me. He calls him Father. I want to know, do you have the ability that in your worst moment, in the moment of your greatest pain and greatest struggle, in the moment of your excruci excruciating agony, can you still see him as your father? Do you see him in relationship? Do you see him in closeness? Do you see him in intimacy? Do you see him as father? Many of us, when we talk to God, we're far too formal. We have all these titles for him. We call him by all these wonderful names, uh, majestic and holy and the potentate of the world. But whenever you recognize that he is dead, that he is a father who never leaves you by yourself. He's a father who never forsakes you, never turns his back on you. The fatherhood of God is what Christ appealed to in his final word. And then he says to the father, the thing that is most treasured to me. I am committing into your hands. I'm giving you my spirit. He gives him 
his spirit. He turns over that prized possession to the hands of him for safekeeping. He commends his spirit. And the second thing I think that's critical for us is that Jesus understood priority in the midst of his death. He knew the spirit was critical as he prepared to die. And the final thing that I think is critical for us to capture is that the text says that he breathed his last. He gave up the ghost. Now I love this. The King James says he gave the ghost up. I like the way King James puts it, because he gave up what no man could take from him. He willingly gave up the ghost. He was not, he was not on the cross at the will of his crucifiers. He was not on the cross at the mercy of the Roman Empire. He was not suffering on the cross because of the jeers of the crowd. He was not on the cross because of the arrogance of Pilate. He was not on the cross because of the insolence of Caiaphas. He was not on the cross because of the forgetfulness of his disciples. He was not on the cross because of the treachery of the crowd. He was not on the cross because of the vehement anger of the other Jews. He was on the cross by his own choice. He was on the cross because he carried within his hands the power of life and death. And he declared that this life that I have, no one has the authority or the ability nor the capacity to take it away from me. He declared, except I lay down my life, then my life can't be taken from me. It makes perfect sense because he is the father of life. He is the giver of life, and he who gives life cannot have life stolen from him. He who gives life maintains the capacity to give up his life, and so he breathed out his last. He gave up the ghost. When he gave up the ghost, I can only imagine that heaven starts to gasp. When he gave up the ghost, I can imagine the angels paused in their tracks looked over the banister of heaven in utter awe and shock that the very one who spoke the world into existence was now experiencing the unthinkable. The world was being taken from him in his very last breath. How could God who created life have life taken from him? The angels have scratched their heads trying to understand, but they didn't capture the full weight of God's redemptive plan. God's redemptive plan was in the voluntary act of Jesus' death. He had to die by choice. He had to die because he chose to die. That made him the better lamb than the lamb of the Paschal system in the Old Covenant. They died because they were led to the slaughter. He was not led to the slaughter. He voluntarily went to the slaughter. I'm so glad that he chose to die on my behalf. Can I get a witness here? Had he not chosen to die, you would be in your sins and I would be in my sins. But thanks be to God, he died in our place. He died on our behalf. He died for our salvation. He died for our redemption. He died for our sanctification. He died for our glorification. He died that we might live again. Can I have a witness here? He voluntarily gave up the ghost. And when he voluntarily gave up the ghost, the spirit went to the father. As the spirit goes to the father, I can only imagine that angels are standing around seeing the spirit of the son being raptured in the hands of the father. I think that's what the psalmist meant when he said, lift up your heads, O ye gates and be lifted up you everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in can i get a witness here now here's what i want to leave you with i want to leave you with this thought just as jesus gave up the ghost you and i will have the ultimate opportunity to give up the ghost listen carefully 
you and I have the opportunity that when we die, our body is going to be committed to the ground, but only for a little while. Our body is going to be committed to the ground, but because he rose from the dead, because he came back and reanimated his flesh, he is the firstborn among many brethren. Now you and I will have our opportunity to be reunited with our spirit and our flesh shall rise again from the dead. That's called a great getting up morning is what my grandmother used to call it. When we all rise from the dead, the story is told about an old missionary, a missionary who went to Africa and served on the mission fields in Africa for 25 years and he took sick while in Africa and boarded a boat in the early 1900s, in the early 20th century rather, boarded a boat to come back to America so he could die. He so happened to get on the same boat as President Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt was in his private cabin with his massive and enormous entourage coming back from a hunting trip in Africa. And this old missionary, Samuel Morrison, gets on the boat. Unbeknownst to him, the president is in his own cabinets. When the boat docks in New York City, he looks outside the window and this uncelebrated, unsung hero of the kingdom, serving and giving his life, his sweat, and his blood in Africa, looks outside of his window and sees throngs and throngs of people lining up. And he imagines that maybe this parade is for him. Maybe somebody is recognizing his service. He gets up out of the ship and he starts to walk down the planks. They stop him as he's walking. The crowd is waving flags in the air and they stop him. The, the security guards stop him and tell him the president is coming. And Theodore Roosevelt walks off the plank, gets down to the dock and the people are cheering and lauding him in New York's Manhattan Harbor. And when the president leaves, the crowd leaves, and Samuel Morrison gets off of that boat, nobody cheers, nobody greets him, nobody meets him. He's left all by himself. Because of the enormous crowd, he can't even catch a cab. He, in his sick body, has to walk all the way to his home. When he gets to his house, he falls down on his knees and he is a bit disturbed with God. And he asks God, I've been serving you for 25 years. No crowd greeted me. No throngs of people were lauding my name. Nobody called my name. There was no one there to celebrate me. And I've been serving and I've been giving. Where is my celebration? When he laid down that night, the Spirit of God began to speak with him and said, Samuel, you've gotten it wrong. You see, the reason why they celebrated the president is because the president made it home. But don't you forget, you have not made it home yet. Your home is yet to come. There's going to come a day, Samuel, when you will make it home when the crowds will be standing around like a great cloud of witnesses, when the angels will lift their voice and sing, a child of God has made it home. I want to share with you today, you have not made it home yet. You have not made it to that crystal shores yet. You have not made it to that celestial sky yet, but the day is coming when you lay down your mortal and pick up your immortality. The day is coming when you lay down your corruption and pick up your incorruption the day is coming when you will make it home and you'll hear the sound 
of the angels singing and saying, welcome home, welcome home. The body and the spirit reunited together in a glorified union, in a royal trans transmission, and they've made it home. Father, I thank you that we will make it home. We commit our spirit into your hands for safekeeping. May we make it home. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Everyone standing, everyone standing. If we have heard this word preached on today, these seven preachers sharing the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. It is only appropriate now that we make sure you can go home when it's your time to see the Lord. If you don't know him as your personal savior, he died on Calvary's cross so you could live eternally with him. And he grants each of us the gift of his grace to forgive us for all of our unrighteousness so that we stand before the Father. He doesn't see us, but he sees the reflection of his own son. If there's one under the sound of my voice, come on down today. We want to introduce you to Jesus. We want to put your hand in God's hands today. As we sing, this is our call. Give your life to the Lord today. That who so seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen today. Before we dismiss, if there are any ministers of the gospel that are in the audience, would you please stand? All the ministers of the gospel, would you please stand? Amen, 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 amen. We thank you for your presence here today and for your commitment to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. We want to thank God for all of our guests, all of our guest churches that are with us today. If you are from a guest church, just lift your hand up, a guest church. Come on, let's give them a hand. Green Forest. Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much for coming, supporting these preachers, these pastors. We want to thank God for these preachers of the gospel. Did not our hearts burn within today as they share the word of God. Pastor Harris, thank you so much for bringing it home in that way. He said that he may be borrowing from some preachers. Pastor, we were all taking notes on you. Amen. 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 Our hearts and minds are clear. Let us stand for our closing selection at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for these men and women of the gospel that, God, you would pour back into them everything they have poured out to us. We pray for a double portion of your anointing as they prepare their hearts and their minds and their souls to preach this weekend. God, we preach the cross today, but we know come Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning, there's going to be a quaking in the earth. We know come Sunday morning that a stone will be rolled away. We know come early one Sunday morning. God, there's going to be a resurrection, and we pray for resurrection preaching power to flow from the hearts and minds of these procrastinators of the gospel. Then we pray for every preacher under the sound of my voice that, God, you would give them a rhema word that they may evangelize the lost and preach this gospel throughout the entire community. Then we pray for all of the hearers of the gospel today. God, let them take this word and and share it with somebody else that the word of God may go forth and bless this nation. Now may the grace of God and sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth now and forevermore. And we sing in threefold. and may the Lord be with each one of you.